You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. We are now done with our latest Wealth Formula Meetup, the huge success in Phoenix, Arizona. Everybody uh, I talked to had a blast. Gosh, why didn't you come? For those of you who didn't, you really ought to consider coming to one of these events, especially if you are somebody who listens to the show on a regular basis. I mean, I think, you know, coming to one of these events really takes it to the next level, whether, you know, especially if you're an investor in our investor club, but it was great to see a bunch of faces out there. Thanks for coming. We had people from all over the place and it was just, you know, really wonderful time. We learned a lot. I actually spoke about longevity, believe it or not. Isn't that kind of funny? But well, we're going to talk a little bit about that in upcoming shows as well. But in the meantime, let's move on with the concept of today's show. And today's show really, it's a question of, you know, whether economics is something that everybody can understand or it's just common sense. You know, here's the thing from what I know, and listen, I'm, I'm not a professional economist or anything like that, but understanding economics, understanding personal finance even, for me, has really just come down to understanding human behavior and human behavior that's based on incentives. I mean, after all, that's sort of the definition of what economics is, is understanding human behavior based on incentives. Don't know what I mean? Let me give you a very interesting example. I think this is cool. And I, I heard about this first reading one of those Freakonomics books, which I think are fascinating. So there's this thing, it's called the Cobra Effect. And this was a term coined by economist Horst Siebert. And he was describing a situation a while back when India was under British rule and the local governor was trying to figure out what to do with an apparent uptick of venomous snakes in Delhi killing people left and right. So the governor decided to do what made sense to him. He implemented a bounty system, a bounty system and paid handsomely for each and every dead cobra that could be produced. So all of a sudden you get all these poor people out there killing cobras left and right, making some money, making a living off of it. And before you knew it, the solution worked so well, there was a significant drop in the number of snakes in the area. But over time... The problem returned with a vengeance. And even though significant dead snakes were being produced, maybe even more than before, and people were getting cash awards for them, the problem didn't seem to go away at all. In fact, it might have gotten a little worse. So ask yourself, what do you think happened here? You know, you might even pause this show and think, what happened? It's actually kind of obvious when you think about it. Well, if you were an Indian person in Delhi, you were poor and you started making really good money by killing snakes and then realized, man, there's a shortage of snakes around here. What would you do? Well, if you were resourceful, you'd try to find more snakes. And the easiest way to do that would to be to make your own snakes. And that's what they did. There was, an, there was a huge movement for snake farms in Delhi, they were raising cobras and they were turning them into the governor, making some money. That is, my friends, the cobra effect. Now, this is a classic example of thinking through the incentives that drive people to come up with some possible outcomes resulting from various situations and policies. And that's essentially what economics is, right? Thinking about in a given situation, what people will do and what will be the outcome based on that. And people may have different ideas about what they think people will do in various situations and policies, right? And there you go. Now you've got different kinds of economists, right? However, like in many fields, economics, particularly financial economics, as we know it really is hindered by a lot of technical jargon and of course, that jargon, you know, it makes academics feel smart. It makes people at the Federal Reserve confuse you and make sure that you don't really understand what's going on in the real world. By the way, why do you think, why do you think that, you know, government officials, people who are running the economy might, might want 
you to feel a little confused. There's another economics question for you. I'm, it's not like I have the answer, but I think they are trying to confuse you. But why are they trying to confuse you? Anyway, my guest on Wealth Formula podcast today is a journalist. He's a journalist at a prestigious newspaper that believes that financial economics is just a matter of common sense. And he didn't really think that uh, at the beginning. He's been a journalist, uh, obviously not a quant. And, and anytime these kinds of discussions came up before the age of 30, he just kind of winced and, and thought he just, you know, wasn't built like that. Anyway, took these matters into his own hands and taught himself economics. And before you know it, he realized that a lot of it, in his opinion, is just common sense. And if it's common sense, most of us should be able to learn it, right? Anyway, that's what he thinks, and he's going to tell us all about it when we come back from these messages. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast is Matthew Hennessy. Matthew is the Wall Street Journal op-ed editor, and he's the author of Visible Hand, A Wealth of Notions on the Miracle of the market. He's also has another book called The Zero Hour for Gen X, uh, which uh, was in 2018. We're not going to talk about that today, but uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the most recent uh, book. Matthew, welcome to Wealth Formula Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, you know, let, let's start out with this question because I, you know, I think the, you know, overall uh, sense that I get is you, you wrote a book, you, you're not, you, you're not an economist, but I think the overall writing message of uh, what I'm getting from you is you don't need to be an economist. A lot of this stuff is sort of common sense. Is that is that fair? Yeah, it's a good place to start. That's definitely fair. I'm not an economist. I'm a journalist. I'm an editor. I work all day with words and not so much with numbers, although occasionally numbers. But um, as you probably know, it's pretty easy in this country and maybe in every country to get through high school without ever having taken a an elementary course in economics. And a lot of people can get through college pretty easily doing the same thing. I certainly was one of them. I never had anybody sit me down and say, you know, uh, one of the things you need to know in order to be an educated person is, uh, you know, how the economic world works. So, you know, I reached the age of maturity. I was almost 30 or so before I sort of tuned into this kind of stuff. And I felt a little bit betrayed by my education because uh, so much of what I found when I started studying economics was, was absolutely essential to understanding everything that I was seeing happening all around me. So I thought I'll write a book that's, you know, aimed for that people who, you know, may have managed to avoid economics, you know, while they were pursuing other things, which is an entirely understandable, uh, approach to life, but you know, you've got some gaps to fill or you might be a young person who hasn't yet encountered this at all. And so I'll, um, I'll give you a primer on basic economics as well as some, you know, funny stories, a few laughs here and there. Yeah, no, then I think that sounds great. Um, I'm curious, you know, um, as you mentioned, a lot of people never even get to the point where they even bother. Why is it important in your view for, you know, anyone to, you know, if you're a surgeon or you're, you know, maybe you're a dentist or whatever, um, what was your moment of feeling like you needed to, you know, that you should be educated a little bit on this and, um, and maybe why more people ought to be? Well, for the main uh, thing is I think that there's, uh, there are several misperceptions you have to deal with. Number one is thinking that economics is just about money. I think a lot of people think, well, economics, that's the business of business. That's uh, the stuff that goes into making a living. And I'm a little bit grossed out by it. And I don't particularly find myself interested in people who spend all their time thinking about it. So that's not really an area for me. Um, that's, it turns out that's not true at all. Economics isn't about money and money comes into it, of course, but it's not, it's not accounting. It's not uh, financial planning. It's not even financial markets. It's simply about choice. It's the science of choice. Now your average educated person, the surgeon that you mentioned, I'm sure can, can, can figure some of this stuff out themselves. Um, but you know, there's, there, there are also misperceptions about markets, what they are and how they work and where they come from. It's my contention that, uh, the free market that, that we live and exist in, in this country, certainly, uh, is at play everywhere, whether the political authorities acknowledge it or not. Uh, it's, uh, it's a kind of an observable reality with uh, forces, uh, you know, invisible forces at work, much like the invisible forces of gravity. You can't, you can't 
uh, uh, defuse them or, or work around them. You have to work within them. And to the extent that people try to do that kind of stuff, they make a lot of problems for themselves. So uh, if you want to understand politics, you obviously you have to understand economics. If you want to understand something about the culture we live in, you have to understand something about the free market system. So, uh, you know, I deal with a lot of those kind of misperceptions. I dispense with some, you know, um, some basic uh, misunderstandings of the market. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. I work for the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. So I'm doing a little cheerleading as well. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the things in the book. Uh, You talk about um, financializing of our economy and how it's convoluting economics. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by that? Well, it's a derivative of what I was just saying, the complexification of things. I think a lot of people grow up thinking that economics is the stock market. Economics is uh, securities and bond prices and interest rates. And, uh, you know, I'm not surprised that a lot of people just want to, you know, keep their their books and have their books in their poetry to protect them. It's like there is a certain cast of mind that wants to keep all that stuff really far away from. I know that when I was a kid and when I was watching the news, anytime they started talking about the Dow Jones industrial average, it was like time to go get a glass of water, you know, like I'm out of here. I don't even know what that means. And I'm not like, I I just have to keep reiterating. I'm not an economist. And and my, my contention is that a lot of academic economists tend to complexify things. So if you turn on your average financial television show, you're going to get a lot of high uh, atmosphere stuff that, that, um, is not accessible to, you know, to, to, to most of us walking around here with our feet on the ground. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, um, over credentialing again, are you kind of getting back to the same thing, which is like, okay, you know, why is over credentialing impeding economic policy? Well, I've got nothing wrong with people who have advanced degrees in economics. I mean, obviously, uh, in any discipline, you're going to have sort of uh, different layers or strata of expertise, and and you know, out there at the at, at the frontier, you're going to need people who understand abstract concepts and who can theorize and who can uh, you know build new structures that that no one will understand for for decades or for centuries. But the rest of us are busy living in in the here and now, uh, so. You know, I I just have a tendency, unlike a lot of other disciplines, um, the interaction or the interplay between the general public and the expertise class when it comes to economics is the gulf is pretty wide. The average person can't follow necessarily uh, the debate about inflation beyond what they see in front of them, beyond what they know intuitively. And so I'm trying to appeal to those instincts when I'm uh, in my book uh, and, and sort of remind people that a lot of this stuff is... Uh, complexified to the point of uh, gibberish and that you're, you're smart enough to understand most of it intuitively. In fact, you're probably already a better economist than you realize. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I don't think it's just economics. This happens in, I mean, it happens, I think in, you know, it just makes me think of all the things in medicine and surgery, all the words we use. And sometimes it's uh, sounds a lot more complicated than it is, but you know, um, let me ask you this though, in terms of people who are credentialed, let's take Janet Yellen, for example, um, uh, who make and defend economic policies that produce results opposite of maybe what's intended. What's that all about? Well, anyone who's making policy has the, the capacity to screw it up. Uh, there, there is no such thing as uh, a, a, a surefire uh, policy in, in the realm of economics or any other uh, field of endeavor. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure she's doing the best she can. Let's just put it that way. Um, why would it help Americans to embrace the economic reality that you can't have everything you want? Well, this is the basis of it all. This is the essence of, of uh, life in the world that we live in, which is a world of limits and a world of scarcity. Life is about trade-offs. That's the kind of the mantra at the heart of my book. You can't have everything that you want. And the sooner that you sort of get hip to this, uh, as a person, the likelier it is that you're going to have a, a smooth ride in this life. So many people uh, uh, embrace or, or accept the promises made by people like Janet Yellen and others that you can have. I don't want to signal, s- single her out. Uh, politicians are very fond of promising all sorts of 
uh, free lunches, none of which, or most of which don't exist. The, the root of the whole thing is that if you want something, if you, if you're going to get something of value, you're almost always going to have to give up something that, that you value in order to get it. A lot of times that's money, but sometimes it's time. It can be, you know, you can, you can think of a dozen different ways that you have to give something up that you value in, you know, in a, in a pre monetary economy, it would be, you know, you'd have to barter for the things that you wanted. Um, so those are the sort of the forces that I, that I excavate and discuss in the book. Um, I defy anyone who's listening here to tell me that they can have everything that they want. It's just not possible. You talk a little bit about gunning money or printing money, and you talk about a little bit about how it limits economic growth. You want to comment on that? Well, I have a short uh, passage in the book about the the problem of inflation. Um, uh, You know, we're all sort of living through it in real time, watching the various definitions of what inflation is get bandied about. Um, very wise man once said it's always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So, um, you know, the basic uh, sort of def- definition of inflation is rising prices. So that doesn't quite cover the whole thing. It, it's really better to understand it as a, as a reduction in the amount of goods and services of the purchasing power of your money. So uh, a very important uh, concept in economics, understanding purchasing power, understand, understanding uh, how currency can be debased and how monetary policy matters for our everyday lives, but very far from the sort of simple basic economics that I promise uh, not to get too deep into the weeds with in my book. So we, we do cover it, but we don't, we don't linger on it. Uh, this would be another example of, of people being better economists than they know. Uh, uh, we have a tendency to economize, which is a, a, an interesting word derivative of the main thing when we're, you know, living our regular lives at the grocery store or at the deciding which gas pump to go to. Um, so we don't necessarily need a PhD in order to make those choices. You, you also talk a little bit about um, free markets and the confusion uh, maybe uh, critics of free markets confusing greed uh, with ambition. You, you, will you talk a little bit about that for us? Yeah, I mean, if you're my age or roughly about your age, you remember um, Gordon Gecko and greed is good. The sort of the caricature of the of the Wall the greedy Wall Street uh, guy who's uh, you know trying to get as much as he can and the heck when, with everyone else. And while he's doing it, he 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 justifies it along perverted economic, uh, free market economic uh, grounds that what he's, you know, what's good for him is good for everybody. It's a kind of a perversion of Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand um, and, and, the, and, the, and the social benefit that's derived from individuals pursuing their self-interest, all of which is true, um, you know, but it's a caricature. So uh, most people of the sort that I was mentioning at the beginning absorb this caricature and they, and they uh, integrate it into their lives without ever stopping to, to, to think whether there's actual uh, truth at the root of it. So my contention is not that greed is good. I don't think it is. I think it's an unhealthy uh, expression of uh, a normal human impulse. It's an abundance of a normal human impulse that's probably not healthy. But ambition is very good and very natural. And by ambition, I mean the ambition to care for yourself, to care for your family, provide for the people who depend on you and to reach your full potential as a human in whatever way that you define it. Um, The free market system. uh, I try to avoid calling it a system because I don't think it is a system for reasons that I mentioned in the book, Uh, but free markets allow people to do that. They allow them to reach their full potential. They allow an avenue for um, human expression and human fulfillment that other economic systems that are in fact systems in the sense that they were created um, specifically, uh, you know, almost as if in a workshop um, and overlaid onto, onto societies. Um, Those other systems don't allow for those kind of, don't allow for ambition to reach its full potential or to find its full flowering. So uh, yeah, I don't think uh, greed is good, although it's an obvious, um, you know, fact of life. I think ambition is entirely, uh, wonderful, and we should encourage it. There's a, um, sometimes a little bit of a subjective, um, you know, so what, what somebody might be ambitious, but another might view that as greed, and that's a very tricky thing. Um, and I think it probably is uh, has something to do with why there's such 
you know, anti-market sentiments um, in general. Do you think that that's true? Yeah, it's certainly a part of it. I mean, people have ideological commitments that require that they um, say nasty things about markets, whether they're on the far left or on the far right. I think most of it springs from ignorance about, A, the alternatives, of which there are almost, you know, there are zero good ones. Uh, And we've run those experiments a number of times, enough times to know that um, the free market for all its faults, and it does have faults, it does produce outcomes that sometimes we, we may not like, is uh, beats the pants off of unfree markets. And uh, anyone who suggests otherwise either has never experienced life in an unfree market or is dreaming of uh, a world that doesn't exist. Yeah, so, you know, it's entirely, it's entirely uh, fair to critic, criticize the free market in, 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 if only because um, we believe that uh, the marketplace extends to ideas as well as to goods and services. So, Anybody wants to bring an argument against free markets, they're welcome to. And it's, uh, it's uh, it, you know, experience shows that uh, people often aren't shy about it. Free markets. Do we need a, you know, you know, obviously we have a shrinking middle class. Do we need a large middle class to exist? Otherwise, you know, how is there another way we can, you know, fix income inequality? Um, no, we can't fix income inequality. We don't need to. I mean, we don't need anything in the free market. The free market produces outcomes. People uh, in the course of a single lifetime, as we know, can move from one uh, so-called class to another. Let's call them, you can call them income brackets or, uh, you know, percentiles, uh, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a market, in a free market, in a, in a democracy, uh, in, in a world where people are free to make decisions and to pursue their interests, uh, they will rise and fall according to their talents and the level of their hard work and the luck and opportunity that, um, uh, presents itself to them. So, no, I don't think we need to do anything about inequality. I think it's, uh, I think it's a red heading in the economic conversation. You know, your, um, so your book, you know, it's obviously, I mean, it's been described, I think, uh, it was Larry Kudlow calls it econ, basically an econ 101 book. And he says econ 101 should always be this much fun, right? And so the book is really, you know, it's essential stuff, supply, demand, incentives, trade-offs, scarcity, innovation, work and leisure. And you've designed it uh, to, you know, so a teenager could, potentially read it and understand so i mean that's that's a a great opportunity i think for especially our audience i'm curious on your you know you mentioned that you you really didn't go down this road until you were 30 or so having learned what you have and having this sort of new body of information regardless of whether how much it is common sense or not per se how is it changed your view on the world or of anything in your everyday life? Well, it's pretty momentous. I mean, um, you know, if you, as I was saying earlier, if you live your life thinking that you can have it all, that you don't have to make trade-offs, you're going to get a lot of friction uh, when, when you're making decisions about who you, who you're going to be, how you're going to invest in yourself what you're going to do and what you aren't going to do. Um, So for me personally, it, it's made all the difference. I think like an economist, I'm not an economist, but I look at the world. I, I, I try to bring that lens to it to understand that I live in an environment of scarcity. There are limits. I have to make trade-offs. The choices that I make are often made at the margins. That is to say, it's not an all or nothing uh, proposition most of the time. It's often a question of a little bit more or a little bit less. Um, You know, you don't kind of make, you don't typically make these kind of economic um, calculations explicitly uh, when you're deciding whether to go to college or whether to, uh, you know, change careers or to put a little money away for your kids to save for their education, to go on a vacation. I mean, often it's kind of done implicitly. You just make it, you know, uh, based on what your gut tells you. But um, 
you know, not everybody's gut gives them good advice. So it's important to have a little bit of a framework uh, laying over. I, you mentioned, you know, that, that a teenager could understand this stuff. And I, I certainly agree. I didn't pitch the book at teenagers. It's not written at a, a, at a level that's designed. Well, I mean, you know, we should give teenagers a little more credit than they probably, they would prefer that we gave them some more credit than they often get. I mean, it's, it's written in a, in a, in a accessible style, let's just say that. My whole purpose here is to try to make it less boring because I think that even if, let's just say you're one of those people that stayed away from econ, econ 101 or whatever, and they made you take it as a kind of a requirement. I don't know what school this would be that would make you do that. But let's just say you did, almost certainly on the first or the second day, they're gonna be hitting you with a Y axis and an X axis and derive demand and derive supply and the points move this. And a lot of people just shut down. They just can't learn in that environment. Their just brains are just not uh, built to absorb information that way. So I'm coming at it from a from a different perspective. You know, some people are music, some people are words, and and uh, I like to I like to try to put them together and make it sing. So um, it's not for teenagers, uh, in, unless you know, except that it's for everyone, and, and we include teenagers in everyone. <laughs> Well, fantastic. You know, the, uh, so again, the book is a uh, visible hand, a uh, wealth of notions on the miracle of the market. Uh, I presume, uh, we can get this pretty much anywhere, uh, Amazon and, um, the usual suspects in terms of bookstores. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny that Amazon and then it's like dot, 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 you know, I mean, that's kind of how that market has arranged itself, but yeah, it's available everywhere. Uh, you know, Barnes and Noble, Target, um, smaller bookstores as well. If you happen to have one, if they don't have it, you should ask them to get it. Is there an audio book uh, yet? In fact, there is an audio book. Good. Um, That's why most people make- seem to consume things these days anyway. So, Well, for a rah-rah uh-huh. uh, uh, kind of uh, red, white, and blue defense of capitalism, it's kind of humorous. They got a, a very distinguished sounding British uh, gentleman to, to read it. So, <laughs> you know, I'm i I'm an Irish American, so I have a complicated thoughts about the whole thing, but um, you know, I that's suppose funny. somebody somewhere knows what they're doing. I guess, I guess that's, I guess they do. I mean, that's funny. <laughs> okay. Well, Hey, Matthew, thanks so much for being on Wealth Formula podcast. Uh, I'm very uh, curious in, about this book. I might uh, grab a copy, trying to figure out ways, uh, you know, to sort of explain economics, uh, to people sometimes and uh, maybe you have some some ways to do it that i haven't thought about so thanks again and uh good luck on the book and ho- hopefully we can have you back soon okay take care Bob. we'll be right back welcome back to the show everyone hope you enjoyed it one thing i will say about this event that we had again is that it makes me think about how many people really could benefit from being part of our online community wealth formula network. If you enjoyed this event, this live event, I mean, that's basically what wealth formula network is. Uh, we do a biweekly zoom video conference. We have a Facebook group, you know, there's a course involved as well to help you get caught up on some of the basic jargon that is personal finance. Anyway, Check it out if you want. The website there is wealthformularoadmap.com and wealthformularoadmap.com, it's gonna, that page is like a sales page and it has like a cheesy uh, sales video on it. You can skip that. Basically, it's a great course with a lot of smart people in it like Tom Wheelwright, Kenny McElroy, and then you've got this community behind it and we'd love to have you on it. That's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.